one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, The Exaltation Complication. What do I mean by that title, The Exaltation Complication? Well, let's deal first off with the term exaltation. Now, we know in the LDS Church that exaltation is defined in a very specific way. And it is defined as the family unit, the nuclear family unit, being exalted to live together forever in the celestial kingdom. And not just in the celestial kingdom, but in the highest degree of glory in the celestial kingdom. The LDS Church has hammered home for decades the idea that this exaltation and this sublime eternal happiness can only be found there in the highest level of the celestial kingdom, and it can only be found there by a family that is sealed here together on earth and is exalted to that high degree of glory. In order to accomplish this, sealings are performed in the temple. A sealing to a husband and wife, and after they are sealed and have children, those children are, quote, born in the covenant, unquote. Which means that by virtue of their parents' sealing, any children born to that couple who has been sealed is thereby automatically sealed to them. If the parents are not sealed in the temple before having children, then the children must go to the temple to perform a separate ordinance with their parents in order to be sealed to them. It is only through this sealing ordinance performed husband to wife and parents to children that the family can be exalted in the celestial kingdom. And that is where the fullness of joy is found. And only there is the fullness of joy found. Well, that sounds wonderful. Well, I mean, presuming that you actually want to be together with your family forever. In a situation where a child has an abusive parent, which unfortunately happens all too frequently in this world, both inside the church as well as outside the church, such a child may wonder about the fullness of joy that will be had by them by being sealed together and living eternally with their abusive parent. And even this hypothetical, which is not just a hypothetical, but is only too much of a reality in too many circumstances, begins to show why it is that this fundamental understanding of what constitutes exaltation in the LDS Church is complicated. It has complications. This is just one of them. And what we're going to talk about tonight has to do with additional complications to the LDS teaching of exaltation, and hence the title of this podcast, The Exaltation Complication. Now, I don't think that anybody out there who is or has been a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will find much fault with my definition of how the church teaches the concept of exaltation. Even to the primary children, we teach that it involves the nuclear family, the family that we have here on this earth that is supposed to be exalted. How does that primary song go? We can be together forever through Heavenly Father's plan. I always want to be with my own family. See, my own family, the nuclear family, the family that exists here on earth. I always want to be with my own family, and the Lord has shown us how we can. The Lord has shown us how we can, and that is through the sealing ordinances in the temple. I don't want to beat a dead horse on something that is so obviously a cardinal teaching of the LDS Church, but it is important to have this concept of exaltation fixed firmly in our mind before we can deal with the complications to that concept. And as I say, the first complication has to do with members of our family here on earth that maybe we don't want to be with us forever. Now, the obvious argument to that is if you have an abusive parent, well, then that parent is not going to be worthy to go to the celestial kingdom and therefore you will not have that particular abusive parent in the celestial kingdom. But then the question is raised, okay, so what parent is going to take that parent's place in the celestial kingdom? Let's say your child who has an abusive father. If the father is not going to be in the celestial kingdom with your family, then some other guy has to be tapped to take his place. Why? Because you can't just get to the celestial kingdom with the kids and your mother and no father. That doesn't work under the LDS paradigm. Your mother has to be sealed to some man who is righteous enough to go to the celestial kingdom with her. Otherwise, she cannot go there, and you cannot go there with her as a family. This leads to the necessary corollary that some other man has to be tapped in order to marry your mother, in order to be sealed to your mother, a worthy man, one who is qualified to go to the celestial kingdom through his own righteousness. Well, if your dad is not because he's abusive or for any other reason, then somebody else has to be drafted to take his place. 
So we can already see that the plan of exaltation as taught in the LDS Church immediately has to be complicated. It has to be modified somewhat from the general principle. It is not simply going to be the nuclear family here on earth that makes it to the celestial kingdom in many cases, although that is the ideal and that is what is taught. There are going to have to be exceptions made, and these exceptions fall into two major categories. First off, people being subtracted from your family. In other words, there are certain members of your family that are not going to be able to make it to the celestial kingdom because some of them will not be worthy enough to make it to the celestial kingdom. Therefore, there will be missing places at the dinner table in the celestial kingdom. Not all members of the family will make it. But what if you really, really want to be with your family in the celestial kingdom? but one of them is not worthy enough. Well, too bad for you. If that person is not individually worthy enough to make it to the celestial kingdom, they're not going to be there. So therefore, you will not be able to be there as a family, as a complete family, as a whole family in the celestial kingdom, which leads some people to wonder if I end up in the celestial kingdom without all the members of my family whom I love so much and want to be with together forever, how can I possibly have a fullness of joy without that person, without that member of the family being present? The other side of that coin has to do not with missing members of the family in the celestial kingdom, but having members added to your family in the celestial kingdom. We already talked a little bit about this with the example of the abusive father. Well, the abusive father can't be there in the celestial kingdom. And by the way, even if the father is not abusive, but simply becomes disaffected from the church, but in all other respects is a wonderful father, you love him very much, but he simply becomes disaffected from the church. Well, he's not going to be there either. Instead, some other person's going to have to be added to the family to become your new father, your eternal stepfather, as it were. Or if it's the mother who becomes disaffected, well, then there's going to have to be a new stepmom for eternity in the celestial kingdom. You have no idea who this will be, but just as the man is not without the woman, neither is the woman without the man in the Lord. Or to paraphrase it, even as the father is not without the mother, so is the mother not without the father in the Lord, i.e. in the celestial kingdom, as the LDS Church interprets 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 11. But there is another aspect of celestial marriage where people can be added to the nuclear family here on earth. And that doesn't have to do with replacing an errant father or replacing an errant mother with replacing an errant husband or replacing an errant wife. It has to do with the concept that is still alive and well in the LDS Church, that plural marriage exists in the eternities. In other words, there is polygamy and will be polygamy in the highest level of the celestial kingdom. That practice may have been discontinued here in the LDS Church on earth, but it certainly will exist in the eternities. And the reason we know that is because according to LDS teachings and practice, a man who is married in the temple for eternity to a woman, and that woman passes away, that man can be remarried in the temple to another woman. And both of those marriages are not only for time, but also for eternity. So they will be in full force and effect in the eternities, in the celestial kingdom. And therefore, that man will have the first wife as his wife there. He will also have the second wife as his wife there. He will be a polygamist in the celestial kingdom. Now, this is not just theoretical. It is actual. Because in the LDS Church today, and I'm recording this in October of 2019, in the LDS Church today, the president of the LDS Church, Russell M. Nelson, has two wives who have been sealed to him for eternity. He had his first wife, who he was sealed to in the temple. She passed away. He has remarried to a second wife, Wendy. And according to LDS doctrine and teaching, he will have both wives in the celestial kingdom. Not only does this apply to Russell M. Nelson, it also applies to the first counselor in the first presidency, Elder Dallin H. Oaks, who is in the same position as President Nelson. He also has a wife that he married in the temple who passed away, and then he subsequently remarried another woman in the temple. So although he only has one wife at a time here on earth, he will have two wives with him for eternity. There is simply no getting around the fact that part and parcel of Mormon doctrine is that there will be plural marriage in the celestial kingdom. Now this situation and this teaching has caused a great deal of of heartache and grief and continues to cause a great deal of heartache and grief for second wives as well as for 
the families of those involved who are really, really wondering how it is that they can be happy forever in the celestial kingdom when they are a second wife, when they are a plural wife, and will be forever. And that is exactly the subject that Elder Dallin A. Chokes, one of these polygamists I mentioned to you, addresses in his talk in General Conference. Elder Oaks gave the last talk of the Saturday morning session in General Conference, and to my surprise, he addresses this issue squarely at the outset of his talk, and he does so by means of two anecdotes. Here is the first anecdote which he tells, and he does so by means of reading a letter he says he received some time ago from a woman. Now, this woman was getting ready to marry a man in the temple, but this man she was getting ready to marry in the temple had already been married in the temple. His first wife had passed away, so now she's lining up to become a plural wife. This is really a double bind that this teaching of the church puts such women in, because in the first place, she must be sealed to a husband in the temple in order for her to gain exaltation, but in the second place, she is being sealed into a polygamous relationship where many women in such a position have great doubt and concern as to how it is heaven is going to be heaven at all in an eternal polygamous union. Play the tape. My dear brothers and sisters, a letter I received some time ago introduces the subject of my talk. The writer was contemplating a temple marriage to a man whose eternal companion had died. She would be a second wife. She asked this question, would she be able to have her own house in the next life, or would she have to live with her husband and his first wife? I just told her to trust the Lord. Now, first off, I want to reiterate that the spectacle we have here is not just any speaker in general conference giving this talk about plural marriage in the eternities, but it is Elder Oaks, who himself has two wives sealed to him for eternity. We are getting this straight from the lips of a guy who is an eternal polygamist, and he is going to address this question obviously because it is causing a lot of concern in the church, that he feels it important enough to address it in general conference. Now, he goes ahead and he addresses the question, but unfortunately, unfortunately, he makes a joke out of it. Instead of talking about what is really at the heart of this woman's concern, this soon-to-be second wife's concern, that she is going to have to share her husband with another woman forever, and how is that going to be heaven for her, he instead focuses on her surface question of whether she will have to live in the same house with her husband and his first wife. Now, obviously, what that denotes is her very real concern and her worry and her apprehension about being together in such a family. She puts it in terms of, will I have to live in the same house with him or can I live in my own house? But really, her concern is obvious. But instead of dealing with her real concern, Elder Oaks makes a joke out of it and just tells her to trust in the Lord. Now, trust in the Lord is a fine thing as far as it goes, but when a person has a real concern about their eternal welfare, and this isn't somebody who's out there sinning or somebody who hasn't been fulfilling their callings or paying their tithing or doing everything it is that they're supposed to do. This is a faithful, active member of the LDS Church, and it is specifically because they are faithful and active and doing everything that they're supposed to do that they're thrust into the situation that they have this huge concern of ever being happy in the celestial kingdom because of the way the Lord has set up the program. Or in other words, because of the way the church has set up the program. But here we have a prophet, seer, and revelator, Elder Dallin H. Oaks, second in command in the LDS church, who has no explanation, no insight, no revelation, no inspiration to give to this woman to help her with her very real concerns, other than simply to say, just trust in the Lord. And then when bringing up this letter in general conference that he received from this woman, making a joke out of it. And indeed, we know it's a joke and the audience knows it's a joke because they laugh appreciatively after he says it. Although I can only imagine that any women in the audience who are actually listening to Elder Oaks talk, who are in the same position as this woman who wrote him the letter, I have a hard time imagining that they are laughing at the joke. Because what Elder Oaks has just effectively done is make their very real concerns a laughing matter. 
Nice work, Elder Oaks. Elder Oaks follows this story up with a second story. And this story is going to talk about the same situation of plural marriage in heaven, or in other words, a second sealing of a man to a woman here in this life, from the point of view of the adult children of the first wife. In other words, there's a man who gets married the first time in the temple. They have a bunch of children. These children grow up. The mother dies at some point, and the father is now going to get married to a second wife. And now we're looking at it not just from the point of view of the second wife, which we did in the first story. Now we're going to look at it from the point of view of the adult children of the first wife and their concerns that they have regarding their father remarrying in the temple, another woman, a stepmother to them. And yet, according to the LDS teaching, now they are going to be living in a family with a father and two mothers. Yes, believe it or not, in the LDS church, Heather can have two mommies. And not just here on earth, but forever. And these adult children are concerned. Now, we're never going to find out what it is that their concerns are, but let's hear how Elder Oaks tells the story. Play the tape. I continue with an experience I heard from a trusted associate, which I share with his permission. After the death of a beloved wife and mother of his children, a father remarried. Some grown children strongly objected to the remarriage and sought the counsel of a close relative who was a respected church leader. After hearing the reasons for their objections, which focused on conditions and relationships in the spirit world or in the kingdoms of glory that follow the final judgment, this leader said, quote, You are worried about the wrong things. You should be worried about whether you will get to those places. <laughs> Concentrate on that. If you get there, all of it will be more wonderful than you can imagine. End of quote. So what Elder Oaks tells us by this story is that there are a lot of concerns all around that have been brought to his attention that the leadership know about, not only from second wives sealed to a husband in the temple, but also from the adult children of the first wife who was sealed in the temple. There's a lot of concern about these practices that the LDS Church does and the ramifications that are going to be had on the family in the eternities. Once again, the church teaches that it is the nuclear family here on earth that will exist forever in the eternities, but there are complications to that simple plan. In this instance, multiple wives or multiple mothers, depending upon your relationship, can be added to that family in the eternities. So it is a strange situation that the LDS Church fights so hard today for the nuclear family, that there is one man and one woman in the nuclear family. They are certainly against gay marriage. They're also certainly against polygamy here in this life. And yet the church that is so vehement in its opposition to polygamy and to polygamous offshoots from Mormonism, nevertheless embraces the exact same idea and doctrine, not only in the early ages of Mormonism, but also in the hereafter. According to the LDS Church, God has sanctioned polygamy in the past, and God will sanction polygamy in the future, and we perform ordinances in the temple to make sure that polygamy will happen in the future. It is only in the here and now that God really, really hates polygamy. It is no wonder that this situation causes so much concern and distress among members of the church. But what is Elder Oaks' response to this? Both in the first story and in the second story, the response is the same. Just trust in the Lord. And by the way, you adult kids, you're asking the wrong question. Isn't that a nice way to validate somebody and their concerns? He listened to their concerns. This church leader, unnamed church leader, listens to their concerns, but he doesn't address them. Instead, he says, you're worried about the wrong thing. Don't be worried about how it's going to be like forever to have two mommies. Instead, you just worry about whether you are living righteously enough so that you can go to heaven yourself. Because only by living righteously enough to go to heaven and the celestial kingdom will you have those two mommies forever. It seems to be an obvious dodge of the real question. And such answers to questions by church leaders are not satisfactory to a growing number of members of the church. It reminds me of Henry B. Eyring's son. 
Henry J. Eyring, who at BYU-Idaho about a year ago gave a talk on the Book of Abraham and other aspects of the church. And he talked about having doubts about the church and wondering whether the church is true. And he taught that whenever you have doubts or wonder whether the church is true, whatever aspect of the church it might be, whether it's the book of Abraham or something else, that when you have those doubts, what you're doing is you are asking the wrong question. You should not ask. Indeed, you should never ask whether the church is true. Instead, you should ask, am I true to the church? This is the exact same kind of deflection that we're talking about. Any concern that you have about the church, its teachings, its history, its doctrine is irrelevant. The problem is never with the church. The problem is always with the doubting or questioning member, even when those doubts or questions are valid. And in this case, actually based upon church teachings. If it weren't for the church teachings about plural marriage in the celestial kingdom, then there wouldn't be these concerns. But from the church's point of view, there can be no valid or legitimate basis for concern. You just trust in the Lord. You just worry about making yourself worthy, which kind of means doing everything that we tell you to do. Just worry about doing everything that we tell you to do and everything else will work its way out. Just trust us or in other words, just trust God, which is kind of the same thing when you're listening to people who claim to be speaking for God. Oh, and by the way, we're just supposed to trust the Lord, right? He'll make everything right in the next life, no matter how bad things are in this life. And we hear this over and over again in the church. If we have problems in this life and we pray to God to make it right and God doesn't make it right, well, that's okay because God will make it right in the next life. If we are sick or ill in this life and we receive a priesthood blessing and people pray for us and we pray for ourselves to make ourselves whole and we're not made whole, well, God isn't letting us down. He'll make it better in the next life. Remember Patricia Parkinson from April 2019 General Conference. Elder Hales told us about her. She was blind from a young age and she prayed to God and prayed and prayed and suffered from bouts of depression and her family prayed to God. And I'm sure she received many priesthood blessings that her sight be restored. And yet those prayers went unanswered. And so the guarantee that Elder Hales gives us is that she will not receive her sight in this life, but that God will make everything right in the next life. This seems to be a pattern of the constant deferment of God's blessings to many members of the church in mortality. So when leaders of the church tell us to trust in God because he'll make everything better in the next life, the question that comes to my mind is, how is trusting the Lord working in this life? What if God doesn't do any better in the next life than he has done in this life? In other words, if we pray to God and are faithful in this life, but God does not answer our prayers and make things right, on what basis are we to have faith in God that he will do a better job in the next life? If we are blind in this life and receive priesthood blessings and pray and pray and have faith in God and are faithful, and yet we remain blind, why should we think God will restore our sight in the next life? Or from an LDS perspective, If we are homosexual and choose to live a faithful and loveless life in mortality with the hope that God will change us in the next life and make us heterosexual, even though we have prayed desperately and lived faithfully to be made straight in this life, on what basis are we to have faith that God will make us straight in the next life? Now, once again, this is from a strictly faithful LDS perspective. If we are homosexual and we know that that is not how God wants us to be, he wants us to be straight because that's how the whole plan of salvation is arranged according to church leaders. It can only be a man and a woman sealed in the temple for eternity who go to the top level of the celestial kingdom who are in fact exalted. So we pray and we pray to be made straight in this life and yet God does not answer our prayers. We remain homosexual and miserable On what basis is such a person to have faith that God will make them straight in the next life? Will God's power somehow become greater to answer our prayers in the next life than it is in this life? Will God's power somehow become greater to respond to priesthood blessings in the next life than in this life? One other thing I want to say about these two stories that are told by Elder Oaks is that without coming out and saying it point blank, what he has done by telling these stories is he has underscored the doctrine that there will in fact be plural marriage in the celestial kingdom and that he will be one of those polygamists. This alone is remarkable that Elder Oaks has done this and that he has done it 
in General Conference, October of 2019. Now, once again, I want to say that it is clear that this is a problem among many members of the church. Otherwise, Elder Oaks would not be addressing this subject in General Conference. And I'd like to tell you a personal story right now about somebody I know who left the church over issues relating to exactly this kind of thing. And that person is my oldest daughter, Sylvia. Sylvia is now 31 years old, and she grew up in the church. She was raised in the church. She ended up leaving the church right after she graduated from high school and has not been back. She is completely disassociated with the church. I have known that for a number of years, but it was only in the last couple of years that Sylvia told me why it is that she became disaffected from the LDS church. My first marriage was in the temple in Dallas, Texas in 1985. Sylvia was the firstborn out of that marriage. She was born in the covenant in 1988. As fate would have it, her mother and I separated in 1993 and were eventually divorced. Sylvia's mother moved to Utah, taking Sylvia and her little brother with her. Although I had visitation with Sylvia, her mother was awarded custody. So Sylvia effectively grew up from that point on in Utah and went to church regularly with her mother and her mother's new husband, her second husband. My first wife and her second husband had two daughters who were Sylvia's half-sisters and they grew up together with other children in the household in Utah. But my first wife, second husband, never managed to get his life in order sufficiently that he could go to the temple and be sealed to my second wife. At this point in her life now, Sylvia has grown up to the point where she is a teenager. She is around 16 or 17 years old, and she is attending young women's at church. And in her young women's class one day, the situation regarding her family and her half-sisters and the fact that her mother had never been sealed to her second husband, although she had been sealed to me, became a subject of conversation. And Sylvia, much to her shock, was told by her young women's leader that in such cases, Sylvia's half-sisters, the daughters of her mother and her mother's second husband, would not be their daughters in the hereafter, in the resurrection, in the celestial kingdom, but instead they would be my daughters. Once again, to be clear, Sylvia's half-sisters, the two girls who had been born from the marriage of my first wife and her second husband would not be their daughters in the resurrection. Instead, they would be my daughters because I had been sealed to Sylvia's mom, but her mom had not thereafter been sealed to her second husband. So by virtue of the power of the sealing that I had with her mother from 1985 in the Dallas, Texas temple, Sylvia's two younger half-sisters would be taken away from their natural parents and a person that they did not know, i.e. me, would become their forever father in the eternal world. Sylvia could not believe that she had understood this correctly because it simply made no sense to her. So she pursued that question after church with her church leaders and found out that indeed that was exactly right. That is the teaching of the church. So paradoxically, while on the one hand the church teaches that temple ceilings are required to keep families together forever, in such circumstances as these, the ceiling power actually has the opposite effect and pulls families apart in the eternities. So for Sylvia, it was not the book of Abraham that caused her to become disaffected from the church. It was not the translation of the Book of Mormon. It was not the accounts of the first vision. It was not Joseph Smith's practice of polygamy. She was never one to do a great deal of study in church subjects, like many Latter-day Saints. She was content simply to go to church and learn what it was she was taught there. And unfortunately, by going to church and learning what was taught there and learning what the church really teaches about the sealing power and its effect on such families as hers, she was repulsed by such teachings and ended up leaving the church over it. So having shared with you that personal story, let's go back to the subject of how it is that the celestial kingdom is supposed to be the only place where we can receive a fullness of joy and the question of how it is that we can receive a fullness of joy if there are members of our family who are not going to be there in the celestial kingdom with us. This is a question that President Eyring himself asked at one point in his life and he relates that experience in his general conference talk from April conference 2019. Play the tape. You have all had glimpses of such homes. Many of you have, with the Lord's help, created them. Some have tried with full heart for that blessing, yet it has not been granted. 
my promise to you is one that a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles once made to me. I had said to him that because of choices some in our extended family had made, I doubted that we could be together in the world to come. He said, as well as I can remember, you are worrying about the wrong problem. You just live worthy of the celestial kingdom and the family arrangements will be more wonderful than anything you can imagine. <laughs> so interestingly, President Eyring, no less, had the same question at one point in his life. How can I be happy in the celestial kingdom if there are some members of my family who are not going to be there? It is a legitimate question. And once again, he gets the eerily reminiscent answer from this unnamed member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles to whom he spoke, as Elder Oaks talks about in his second story that he gave in October 2019 General Conference, which we played the audio clip of earlier in this podcast. You are worrying about the wrong problem. You just live worthy of the celestial kingdom, and the family arrangements will be more wonderful than you can imagine. So if you have family members, now for President Eyring, he says it's simply extended families. God forbid that he should have any immediate family members who are not going to make it to the celestial kingdom. But even extended family members, if you have such members of your family who are not going to be able to make it to the celestial kingdom because of choices they have made, and if you are worried about the fact they will not be with you in the celestial kingdom because you're wondering how on earth can your happiness be complete, how can your joy be full in the celestial kingdom if all the members of your family are not there with you? Well, you are worrying about the wrong problem. But isn't this the very problem that confronts us because of the doctrine of the church in this regard? The church first puts family relationships above all else and promotes priesthood authority to bind families together forever. But if some straight, they will not be in the celestial kingdom. Therefore, it is only logical to conclude, as President Eyring did, that the happiness that is reserved for those in the celestial kingdom because of being with their family forever will not and cannot be achieved if that family is not together forever. That is the problem. But now we hear that a person who worries about this is worrying about the wrong problem. All you have to do is live worthy of the celestial kingdom, which of course means continue being a faithful and orthodox Mormon for your entire life. If you do that, God will handle the rest. It will be apparently in a way different from what our doctrine teaches will bring happiness, but it will still be more wonderful than you can imagine. What does that even mean? At a minimum, it seems to mean that the doctrine of the church is not necessarily correct in this regard. And in this same talk from April 2019 General Conference, President Eyring makes the following statement, which gives us a hint as to what he's thinking. Now, you have to listen very closely to the statement to hear how he phrases it. Play the tape. I know that Heavenly Father's plan is a plan of happiness. I testify that his plan makes possible for each of us who has done the best we can to be sealed in a family forever. Stop the tape. Did you hear what he just said? I testify that his plan makes it possible for each of us who has done the best we can to be sealed in a family forever. Not our family forever, but a family. So it appears that President Eyring believes that if our family does not make it to the celestial kingdom, it's okay because we will get sealed into somebody else's family. We will be sealed in a family forever. If this is the case, why do we lay such stress on sealing families together forever if we can just be sealed together with any family and it will still be more wonderful than we can imagine? In the same general conference from April of 2019, President Nelson gave a talk, which is titled, Come Follow Me, but which has come to be referred to as the Sad Heaven Talk. In this talk, President Nelson lays great stress upon the fact that we have to qualify individually in order to be together forever as a family in the celestial kingdom, but that there are some members of the family who are not going to make it. Not his family, of course, because everybody in his family is going to make it. He makes sure that he points that out at the very beginning of his talk. But after first stressing how desperate we will be to know where our family is in the next world, 
and how anguished we will be if we find out that they are not altogether with us in the next world, President Nelson takes the unusual step of offering absolutely no hope in the next world, that things will be better than we can possibly imagine. Now, President Oaks says things will be better than we can possibly imagine. President Eyring says that things will be better than we can possibly imagine. But President Nelson does not even offer that olive branch, that even though our family may not be together forever, it's still going to be better than we can possibly imagine. President Nelson focuses on the letter of the law. And if every member of a family does not qualify for the celestial kingdom on their own merits, then they are simply not going to be there. And that's going to be tough luck for you. And that's actually why it is that you need to get your act together now, because as he puts it, time is running short. I want to play a few clips from that talk by President Nelson in April 2019 General Conference and comment on them as we go along. The first thing he talks about in this regard is the recent and very sad passing of his daughter, which happened mere months before April 2019 General Conference. She was 67 years old at that time. Now, this is the downside of living to such a ripe old age as President Nelson has. He is now 96 years old, and he seems to be in very good health, which is all fine and good as far as it goes. Unfortunately, when you live that long, you start seeing your own children die of old age and complications and diseases that result frequently from old age. Now, in his daughter's case, she ended up dying of cancer. It is a very tragic thing and a very sad story. And I'm sure I don't have to mention at this point that no amount of priesthood blessings given by apostles and even by the president of the LDS Church, the prophet of the Lord, were sufficient to save her from dying of cancer. Now, President Nelson has been accused, because of talks he's given before this, of teaching a God whose love is conditional. He loves us if we do all the things that we are supposed to do, i.e. if we do all the things that the LDS Church requires of us. Then he loves us. If we do not do all the things we are supposed to do, then he does not love us as much. Now, President Nelson has never said it in those exact words, but he has certainly given the indication, not only to me, but to many other people who listen to his talks, that he teaches a God whose love is conditional. And when he talks about his final conversation with his daughter, whose name was Wendy, President Nelson does nothing to disabuse us of that notion. Because he recounts a conversation with his daughter on her deathbed that gives the distinct impression that President Nelson's love for his children is as conditional as the love of God for his children, at least according to President Nelson. Play the tape. As many of you know, our family experienced it. <clears throat> a tender separation three months ago when our daughter Wendy departed from this mortal life. In the final days of her battle with cancer, I was blessed with the opportunity to have a farewell daddy-daughter conversation. I held her hands and told her how much I loved her and how grateful I was to be her father. Now, this is a very delicate situation. Here we have a father who is the president of the LDS Church having a conversation and a farewell conversation at that with his 67-year-old daughter who is about to pass away from cancer. As part of that conversation, President Nelson tells his daughter that he loves her. And not only that he loves her, but he's going to go on and detail exactly why it is he loves her. And as it turns out, from the way he tells this story, it appears the reason he loves her is because she has done everything she is supposed to do as a faithful Latter-day Saint woman. I said... You married in the temple and faithfully honored your covenants. Okay, temple marriage, check. You and your husband welcomed seven children into your home. You followed church teachings by having a lot of children, check. And raised them to be devout disciples of Jesus Christ, valiant church members and, and contributing citizens. You raised your children to be faithful members of the LDS Church, check. And they have chosen spouses of that same caliber. And because you raised your children faithfully in the LDS Church, they also married faithful Mormons as well. Check. Now, as a result of doing all these things you're supposed to do as a good Mormon, how does President Nelson feel about his daughter? Your daddy 
is very, very proud of you. You have brought me much joy. President Nelson is very proud of her and his daughter has brought him much joy. Why? Because she did everything she was supposed to do as a faithful Latter-day Saint. What is his daughter's response to this? She quietly responded, Thank you, Daddy. Now, I don't want to sound too critical about this story that President Nelson is relating because, after all, it does have to do with the deathbed conversation he's having with his own daughter. But if it's possible for the moment to set aside the circumstances of this conversation and focus on the words being used, President Nelson is presenting this story as if he is proud of his daughter and that she brought him joy, not just because she is his daughter, but because she checked off all the boxes that a faithful Latter-day Saint is supposed to check off. The implication of the story is that if she had not done everything that a faithful Mormon is supposed to do, she would not have brought him as much joy and he would not be proud of her, or at least not as proud of her. Now, I know that President Nelson is telling the story in this way because he's setting up for the message he's going to be delivering later on in this talk about how it is that all of our family members must individually be faithful so that the family may live together forever in the celestial kingdom. But still, I have to say, the way this story is related provides bad optics for President Nelson and once again reinforces the perception that his love for his children is conditional upon their obedience to the commandments and why it is that it underscores President Nelson's perception of God and God's love for his children also being conditional upon their keeping the commandments. Next in his talk, President Nelson relates another experience, and in doing so, he speaks of the fires in California from November of 2018, how he and his wife went to visit church members in that location and spoke with one of those church members whose name was John, and he was involved in the rescue efforts during that fire. Play the tape. While there, we spoke at length with the young police officer, John, who was one of many brave first responders. He recalled the thick darkness that descended upon Paradise on November 8, 2018, as flames and embers raced through the town, devouring property and possessions like a scourge and leaving nothing but piles of ash and stark brick chimneys. For 15 hours, John drove through an impenetrable darkness that was streaked with javelins of threatening embers as he helped person after person, family after family, escape to safety, all at the peril of his own life. Yet during that strenuous ordeal, what terrified John most was his all-consuming question, where is my family? After many long, terrifying hours of anguish, he finally learned of their safe evacuation. So we can see exactly where this is going. President Nelson is setting this story up with all the finesse of a bowling pin. John is worried about where his family is. Will he see them again? And of course, President Nelson is going to immediately draw the obvious connection that he wants to make from this story. The account of John's concern for his family has prompted me to speak today with those of you who may ask when approaching the end of your mortal life, where is my family? In that coming day when you will complete your mortal probation and enter the spirit world, you will be brought face to face with that heart-wrenching question, where is my family? And now we start to get into the part of the talk where President Nelson is really putting the screws to his audience. It's not exactly clear why it is that he wants to focus on the distress of people who are not as fortunate as he is who will have all the members of his family in the celestial kingdom. He's focusing on a very large number, in fact, perhaps a majority of members of the church who have members of their family who have not kept all the commandments, who have become disaffected from the church, who have perhaps had their names removed from the records of the church. There really is not a lot of remedy to this problem that he is talking about here. You're going to be asking, where is your family? Well, his message is going to end up being, if they're not with you, 
then that's just too bad for them because they did not individually qualify to be with you forever. And therefore, you're apparently going to be asking, where is my family forever? You're apparently going to be in this great distress forever because your family is not going to be with you forever unless they get their lives in line with the gospel, do everything a good Mormon is supposed to do like Wendy, President Nelson's daughter did, and individually qualify for the celestial kingdom. Going on with the talk. The spirit in each of us naturally yearns for family love to last forever. Love songs perpetuate a false hope that love is all you need if you want to be together forever. And some erroneously believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ provides a promise that all people will be with their loved ones after death. In truth, the Savior himself has made it abundantly clear that while his resurrection assures that every person who ever lived will indeed be resurrected and live forever, much more is required if we want to have the high privilege of exaltation. Salvation is an individual matter. But exaltation is a family matter. So in this clip, President Nelson first emphasizes how everybody very naturally wants to be together with their family forever. That is what we want. At least that is the ideal of what the Mormon image projects upon the membership. We've already talked about exceptions to that ideal previously in this podcast. But President Nelson says this is what we naturally yearn for, to be together forever as a family. But that's not going to happen, repeat, not going to happen unless every single member of that family keeps all of the commandments of God. Even the atonement of Jesus Christ is not enough to make that happen. He will make it so that we live forever, but it's dependent upon what we do and whether we are obedient to the laws and commandments commandments of Mormonism for us to be united forever with our family in the eternities. Also, this last expression that President Nelson uses is important. He says, salvation is an individual matter, but exaltation is a family matter. That is an interesting saying and one we hear quite commonly in the LDS church. The unusual thing about using that expression here is that the entire message that President Nelson is preaching in this talk is completely the opposite of this expression. He says salvation is an individual matter, but exaltation is a family matter. But really, the way he's framing the issue, exaltation is also an individual matter because every individual in the family must individually qualify for exaltation in order for that family to be together forever. So the way he's framing it, the correct articulation of that saying would be salvation is an individual matter and exaltation is also an individual matter. And am I the only one who thinks that President Nelson, when he's talking about love songs that teach that love is all you need if you want to be together forever, is referencing the Beatles song? Is it possible that President Nelson's concept of pop culture is still rooted going on with the talk? Listen to these words spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ to his prophet. Now, before President Nelson starts this quote from the scriptures, please remind yourself, Mormonism is not a legalistic religion. Quote, All covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise are of no efficacy, virtue, or force in and after the resurrection from the dead. For all contracts that are not made unto this end have an end when men are dead. Close quote. Nope, no legalism there. Going on. So, what is required for a family to be exalted forever? We qualify for that privilege by making covenants with God, keeping those covenants, and receiving essential ordinances, and receive and be faithful to those further essential ordinances. So here President Nelson lays it out as plainly as possible. In order for a family to be together forever, every single member of that family must keep all of the commandments, all the covenants, i.e. get baptized, go to the temple, receive the ordinances there as well as temple marriage, keep all the covenants that you make to obey all of the commandments of Mormonism, do that until the end of your life, and if every single member of the family does that, then every single member of the family will be able to be together as a family in the celestial kingdom. And conversely, if any member 
member of the family or multiple members of the family do not obey all the commandments of Mormonism and go to the temple and receive the covenants there and keep those covenants too, then those members of the family will not be present with the family unit in the celestial kingdom. How does this doctrine make President Nelson feel personally, you might ask? Well, the answer is not too good at all. In fact, it causes him anguish. The anguish of my heart is that many people whom I love whom I admire and respect, decline his invitation. They ignore the pleadings of Jesus Christ when he beckons, come, follow me. I understand why God weeps. I also weep for such friends and relatives. Wait a second, did President Nelson also include relatives in that category of people for whom he weeps? Did he just say friends and relatives? Are those relatives of his as well? Does President Nelson also have relatives who will not be making it to the celestial kingdom? I also weep for such friends and relatives. They're wonderful men and women devoted to their family and civic responsibilities. But not good enough for the celestial kingdom. They give generously of their time, energy, and resources but not good enough for the celestial kingdom. And the world is better for their efforts. But not good enough for the celestial kingdom. But they have chosen not to make covenants with God. So even though these people were very good people and did everything that a person should do in order to go to the celestial kingdom, they are locked out forever because they did not sign the correct contract. They did not make the necessary covenant. This is the doctrine that President Nelson is teaching the church. He sounds like Lucy in the Peanuts comic strip after once again pulling the football away from Charlie Brown and looking at the contract and saying, funny thing about this contract, it was never notarized. Next, President Nelson describes the fact that even though these people, these friends of his, perhaps even these relatives of his, were very, very, very good people, because they did not make that covenant necessary for exaltation, they will have to live in a lesser kingdom. Play the tape. That is not the kingdom where they will experience the fullness of joy, of never-ending progression and happiness. Those consummate blessings can come only by living in an exalted celestial realm with God our Eternal Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and our wonderful, worthy, and qualified family members. So notice that President Nelson once again hits the time-honored refrain that only in the celestial kingdom can we receive a fullness of joy, everlasting happiness, but only with those members of our family who are qualified individually to live there with us. This points up, once again, the problem, or in other words, the exaltation complication as to how it is that we can have a fullness of joy and everlasting happiness in the celestial kingdom when there are members of our family who did not make the grade. Continuing with this talk, President Nelson now really starts playing the guild card fast and furious as he lets his audience know that if they really love their family, then they will get in line with the tenets of Mormonism so they can be with their family forever. If you truly love your family and if you desire to be exalted with them throughout eternity, pay the price now through serious study and fervent prayer to know these eternal truths and then to abide by them. Of course, the unfortunate corollary to this teaching is that if you don't get in line with Mormonism, if you don't do what it is you're supposed to do, if you don't follow the teachings of the LDS Church, then you don't really love your family. This is one of the numerous instances in President Nelson's talk where members of the church felt like they were being manipulated, coerced, even threatened. But wait a second. Isn't there the teaching in Mormonism that even if a person does not join the church in this life, they can accept the gospel in the spirit world and have the temple ordinances performed for them so that they may yet achieve exaltation and live together with their family forever? But no, President Nelson is aware of this teaching and wants to foreclose that option, at least as it pertains to people who have already had a chance to hear about the restored gospel, which of course would include all disaffected members of the church. Disaffected members, by their very nature, have had the chance to hear about the gospel, and President Nelson wants to make sure that they know there will be no second chances in the next world for them. And so he tells this story. Play the tape. One such dear friend of mine had limited experiences with God, 
but he longed to be with his departed wife. So he asked me to help him. I encouraged him to meet with our missionaries in order to understand the doctrine of Christ and learn of gospel covenants, ordinances, and blessings. That he did. But he felt the course they advised would require him to make too many changes in his life. He said, those commandments and covenants are just too difficult for me. Also, I can't possibly pay tithing, and I don't have time to serve in the church. Then he asked me, once I die, please do the necessary temple work for my wife and me so that we can be together again. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm not this man's judge. But I do question the efficacy of proxy temple work for a man who had the opportunity to be baptized in this life, to be ordained to the priesthood, receive temple blessings while here in mortality, but who made the conscious decision to reject that course. President Nelson accomplishes a number of purposes by telling this short story. First, he plays into the general perception, which is very much appreciated and even laughed at by the audience, that people who do not follow the tenets of the LDS Church are simply lazy. It applies to this dear friend of his who did not join the church. It also applies to people who have left the church. If you do not follow the tenets of the church and the two particular things that he mentions are paying tithing and attending church meetings, then it is simply because you don't have time, you can't possibly do it, you're too lazy. Thank you for that re-emphasis of that point, President Nelson. Also, he wants to teach the idea that a person who's had a chance here on the earth to accept the gospel but did not accept the gospel will not be able to achieve exaltation in the spirit world by accepting it there and having the ordinances performed in the temple. Now, he knows that this is a point that is hazy in LDS doctrine. It is not exactly clear whether that is the case, so he doesn't come out and point blank say it. Instead, he implies it strongly by saying he questions whether temple ordinances will have efficacy in the next world for someone who did not accept the gospel here, even though they had the chance to hear it. He then adds that he is grateful he he is not this man's judge. Now, any faithful Mormon listening to President Nelson talk will be under the impression that the president of the church, the prophet of God, will have the mind of God and that indeed, if President Nelson believes this way about the judgment, then God is going to be pretty much on board with the same program. But if we take it a step further, there are two possible implications from what it is that President Nelson is saying. He is leaving open the possibility that God may be more merciful than President Nelson is and may allow this guy into the celestial kingdom anyway. Or the other possibility is that God is as merciless as President Nelson is. Once again, President Nelson showing by his words, his conduct, his messages, that he is a very black and white thinker. He is a very letter of the law guy. And here again, the concept of conditional love is coming through loud and clear. And the love of God, or at least the love of President Nelson, who represents God, is conditioned not just on people being good people, living Christ-like lives, but on top of that, jumping through all the hoops of the ordinances and the covenants that are required within the LDS system of exaltation. If I may be allowed a personal observation for a moment, this is exactly the kind of teaching that we read in the New Testament drove Jesus crazy about with the Pharisees. Jesus led a Christ-like life. Duh, well, he was Jesus Christ. Of course, he led a Christ-like life. And we read about that in the New Testament. But that was not enough for the Pharisees. No, Jesus was scorned by the Pharisees because he did not follow all the little bitty requirements of the law. The Pharisees were very legalistic. And even though Jesus was extremely kind and good to those about him and helped his brothers and sisters in their hardships and mourned with those that mourn and comforted those that needed comforting. That was not good enough to please God according to the view of the Pharisees. And I have to be honest with you, that seems to be the exact same message that President Nelson is espousing in this talk. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how righteous you are. It doesn't matter how many people you help in this life. If you do not receive the ordinances of the temple, you will not be allowed into the celestial kingdom to live forever with your family. You will have to go to a lesser kingdom where, in President Nelson's words, you will have to live for eternity with a much more meager roof over your head instead of dwelling in the mansions of glory. Can you say Pharisee? I knew you could. 
My dear brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ invites us to take the covenant path back home to our heavenly parents and be with those we love. He invites us to come, follow me. Isn't it amazing that President Nelson can take a message that is so antithetical to the teachings of Jesus Christ as we read about them in the New Testament and characterize it as an invitation from Jesus himself to follow him? Well, President Nelson is winding down his talk, but before he closes, he wants to make sure he puts the pressure on his audience. Bye now. Don't delay. Now, as president of his church, I plead with you who have dis distanced yourselves from the church and with you who have not yet really sought to know that the Savior's church has been restored, do the spiritual work to find out for yourselves. And please do it now. Time is running out. And for some reason, when President Nelson says time is running out, I think of the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz turning over that huge hourglass with the red sand in it, telling Dorothy that when the last grain of sand runs out, it's going to be curtains for her and her little dog, too. So you can see why this is called the sad heaven talk. It's going to be a sad heaven for all those faithful Mormons who want to be with their family forever and yet will have empty spaces at the dinner table in the celestial kingdom. Some of the family members will not make it. And there is no hope held out for people in those circumstances. You simply have to do the work here in order to make sure that all your children make it to the celestial kingdom, just like President Nelson did. He is the example to follow in this. And if you don't do that work, and if you are not successful in bringing your entire family into the celestial kingdom, then that's just too bad for you, and it is going to be a sad heaven for you forever. Now, the converse of this message may be the real point that President Nelson is driving at, because the righteous members of the family really cannot do a whole lot at this point to get their inactive members, their disaffected members of the family, back into the church so they can be in the celestial kingdom. So the converse of this message is to lay blame and perhaps, hopefully, guilt on the disaffected members themselves because it is their fault that mom and dad will not be happy forever in heaven. They're the ones who need to get their act together. They need to get back to church they need to get paying their tithing and attending their church meetings so that mom and dad will not be miserable forever and it will be all their fault. Now, I want to just make a few more comments before I end this podcast, and it has to do with the fact that President Nelson, as well as really President Oaks and President Eyring and all church leaders for the last few decades at least, have made it very clear that in order for a family to be together forever in the celestial kingdom, each of them individually has to qualify for the celestial kingdom. Now, this teaching makes sense in one regard. Everybody is judged according to their own works and according to their own merits. At least that part is consistent. The problem with this teaching is that it ends up completely nullifying the importance of being sealed in the temple in the first place. What do I mean by that? Well, simply put, if every individual member of a family has to qualify on their own to get to the celestial kingdom, then there is no need to seal them together in order to get them to the celestial kingdom. They do that on their own. And if every single member of a family has to individually qualify to get to the celestial kingdom, why do they need to be sealed in order to be a family in the celestial kingdom? Short answer is, they don't. So this is the problem with the current teaching that every member of the family has to individually qualify for exaltation in the celestial kingdom is that it diminishes, if not completely eviscerates, the importance of being sealed together in the temple. What is the point of being sealed together as a family in the temple if every member of the family has to make it on their own merits to the celestial kingdom anyway? Now, there is another teaching, another doctrine out there in Mormonism that stands in tension with this teaching of President Nelson. And the most famous iteration of that teaching was given by Elder Orson F. Whitney in General Conference in April of 1929. So 90 years ago, Elder Orson F. Whitney, a member of the Apostles, gets up and he says the following. The prophet Joseph Smith declared, and he never taught more comforting doctrine that the eternal sealings of faithful parents and the divine promises made to them for valiant service in the cause of truth would save not only themselves, but likewise their posterity. 
So this is an interesting statement, and you can see how it stands in contrast to what President Nelson is saying. What Elder Orson F. Whitney of the Apostles said 90 years ago is that by virtue of the ceilings made to faithful parents, it can save not only themselves, but it can also save their posterity. Well, does that mean their posterity also has to individually qualify? No, not according to Apostle Orson F. Whitney. He goes on in the same quote, Though some of the sheep may wander, the eye of the shepherd is upon them, and sooner or later they will feel the tentacles of divine providence reaching out after them and drawing them back to the fold. Either in this life or in the life to come, they will return. Now, I know that's an unusual phrase, the tentacles of divine providence. And it may make you wonder whether we worship the God Jehovah of the Israelites or Cthulhu. But nevertheless, that is the expression that Elder Orson F. Whitney chose to use. And it does have the virtue of being memorable. So once again, he is teaching the fact that though the children of parents sealed in the temple may wander, eventually the tentacles of divine providence reach out after them and draw them back into the fold. He goes on, either in this life or in the life to come, they will return. So it doesn't have to be in this life. It can be in the life to come. There is still hope for those wandering sheep who have parents who are sealed in the temple. They will return, he says. That's unqualified. They will return. They will have to pay their debt to justice because they don't get off scot-free. They will have to pay their debt to justice. They will suffer for their sins and may tread a thorny path But if it leads them at last, like the penitent prodigal, to a loving and forgiving father's heart and home, the painful experience will not have been in vain. So what he appears to be teaching is that these children of parents who are sealed in the temple, if they wander, if they stray, they are not lost. Even if they don't come back to the church in full activity in this life and do not have their sins forgiven by Jesus Christ, they will have to pay their own debt to justice. They will have to suffer for their own sins. They may have to tread a thorny path in order to do so, but they will return to their parents eventually in the celestial kingdom, and the family will be made whole there by virtue of the power of the sealing between the parents. He concludes with, Pray for your careless and disobedient children. Hold on to them with your faith. Hope on trust on till you see the salvation of God. Now, this is a very interesting teaching by Elder Orson F. Whitney, and there has been a history in the church of trying to deal with this teaching. It shows up every now and again, even more recently, in General Conference, most famously by President James E. Faust in a General Conference talk given back in April of 2003. My dear brothers and sisters and friends, my message this morning is one of hope and solace to heartbroken parents who have done their best to rear their children in righteousness with love and devotion, but have despaired because their child has rebelled or been led astray to follow the path of evil and destruction. I believe and accept the comforting statement of Elder Orson F. Whitney. The Prophet Joseph Smith declared, and he never taught a more comforting doctrine, that the eternal sealings of faithful parents and divine promises made to them for valiant service in the cause of truth would save not only themselves but likewise their posterity. Though some of the sheep may wander, The eye of the shepherd is upon them, and sooner or later they will feel the tentacles of divine providence reaching out after them and drawing them back into the fold. Either in this life or the life to come, they will return. They will have to pay their debt to justice. They will suffer for their sins and may trot a thorny path, but if It leads them at last, like the penitent prodigal, to a loving and forgiving father's heart and home. The painful experience will not have been in vain. Pray for your careless and disobedient children. Hold on to them with your faith. Hope on, trust on, till you see the salvation of God. 
The principle in this statement that is often overlooked is that they must fully repent and suffer for their sins and pay their debt to justice. I recognize that now is the time to prepare to meet God. If the repentance of wayward children does not happen in this life, is it still possible for the cords of the ceiling to be strong enough for them yet to work out their repentance? Perhaps in this life we are not given to fully understand how enduring the sealing cords of righteous parents are to their children. It may very well be that there are more helpful sources at work than we know. I believe there is a strong familial pull as the influence of beloved ancestors continues with us from the other side of the veil. Now, Orson F. Whitney did not make up this statement on his own. He attributes it to Joseph Smith, and obviously he didn't hear it from Joseph Smith himself since he's giving this conference talk in 1929. But what he is going off of is a sermon that Joseph Smith gave on August 13, 1843, at the funeral of Judge Elias Higby. William Clayton, Joseph Smith's scribe, took down what it was that Joseph Smith said on that occasion. And this is the relevant part of the William Clayton account. When a seal is put upon the father and mother, it secures their posterity, so that they cannot be lost, but will be saved by virtue of the covenant of their father, period, end of quote. So that's what Orson F. Whitney is going off of when he says this teaching about the tentacles of divine providence goes back to Joseph Smith, and indeed, it appears to do so. William Clayton was not the only one to transcribe this sermon by Joseph Smith. Franklin D. Richards also wrote down an account of this sermon. And there he wrote down Joseph Smith as saying, The covenant sealed on the foreheads of the parents secured the children from falling, that they shall all sit upon thrones as one with the Godhead, joint heirs of God with Jesus Christ, period, end of quote. So not only William Clayton, but also Franklin D. Richards transcribed Joseph Smith as saying the same thing. Now, making this matter just a little bit more complicated is that there is a third account of Joseph Smith's sermon, and this is written down by Howard and Martha Corey, C-O-R, A-Y. And in their account of Joseph Smith's sermon, there is a condition placed upon the salvation of children in this regard. Here's what they write down. A measure of this sealing is to confirm upon their head, in common with Elijah, the doctrine of election or the covenant with Abraham, which, when a father and mother of a family have entered into, their children who have not transgressed, see there's the conditional that's added in the Corey account, their children who have not transgressed are secured by the seal wherewith the parents have been sealed. So there are two accounts from well-known scribes of Joseph Smith which do not contain this condition that the children not transgress. And then there is a third version by Howard and Martha Corey who do contain this condition that the children must not transgress in order to continue to be sealed to their father and mother and be saved in the eternal world. I will give you three guesses as to which account modern-day apologists as well as church leaders go to. And if you guess the Howard and Martha Corey account, you go to the head of the class. A common apologetic review of these three accounts would say something like the following. And here I will actually be reading the words from an apologetic website. When the church historians amalgamated the entries from the Joseph Smith Diary and the William Clayton Diary to create the version of this discourse that was published. See, this was the version of the discourse that was published. There was no condition in the version of the discourse that was published in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith as well as in the history of the church. The passage that the blessings conferred by the ordinance of sealing parents and children was unconditional, as we have seen in the William Clayton and Franklin D. Richards account. But of course, the apologist wants to favor the Martha Corey account with the condition in it, so the argument goes on. The wording of the published version suggests that the children of parents who receive the fullness of the priesthood can never fall. Yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like. But that idea would be incorrect according to the apologists. Instead, this previously unpublished, i.e. the Corey account, this previously unpublished, more complete account of the prophet's idea does contain a conditional. 
So, of course, since the unpublished account by the Corys lines up with current church teaching, even though it contradicts the William Clayton and Franklin D. Richards account, it is the account of the sermon that should be favored. Once again, this previously unpublished, more complete account of the prophet's idea does contain a conditional. Clearly, this is a more reasonable and consistent doctrine. If it were not for such a conditional, the concept would contradict significant doctrines taught by Joseph Smith not the least of which would be a contradiction of his article of faith that men will be punished for their own sins. And that's the end of that quote from the apologist. So both of these teachings end up having pros and cons. The pro of President Nelson's teaching that we must individually qualify for celestial glory in order to be together as a family in the celestial kingdom is that it treats all people equally. Everybody has to abide by the same rules to get the same reward. On the other hand, the con of President Nelson's teaching is it does away with the significance and importance of temple ceilings. Why do you need temple ceilings that the family has to get there individually on their own merits anyway? On the other hand, the teaching by Orson F. Whitney about the tentacles of divine providence based upon the teachings of Joseph Smith, at least as recorded by his two scribes, William Clayton and Franklin D. Richards, has the pro of giving importance and significance to the temple ceilings. They are significant. They do have importance. They do have a power separate and apart from people having to individually qualify for the celestial kingdom because the power of the ceiling is that if children of parents sealed in the temple are wayward and go astray, it is by virtue of the power of the ceiling that eventually they will be able to be brought to live with the family forever in the celestial kingdom. But that teaching as well has a downside. But the downside of this teaching is that it seems to be unfair in that it favors children of parents who have been sealed in the temple who can be wayward, commit sins, and yet will eventually be saved in the celestial kingdom versus other people who are themselves wayward, not obedient to the gospel, but do not have the good fortune of having parents who are sealed in the temple. Therefore, their disobedience will result in their living forever in a lesser kingdom, and they will not have the good fortune to ultimately be saved in the celestial kingdom because of their parents' sealing. So both of these ideas standing at tension and contradiction to each other to some regard, both have pros and both have cons. What is clear is that the current leadership of the church, as manifested by President Nelson's talk in April General Conference 2019, has very much distanced itself from the teachings of Joseph Smith in 1843 and from Orson F. Whitney in 1929, with the resulting message that you have to be sealed in the temple as a family in order to be saved in the celestial kingdom. But nevertheless, every single member of that family must individually qualify for the celestial kingdom to get there anyway. What are we to make of all of this? Well, if we take the teachings of the current leadership of the LDS Church in this regard and compare them with the experience of my daughter Sylvia in Young Women's and why it was that she left the church, we are left with the remarkable conclusion that the sealing power in the LDS Church does not have the ability to keep families together in the celestial kingdom, but it does have the power to tear families apart. That idea is simply mind-blowing to me. It is not a conclusion I had in mind when I started out this podcast, but as I went through the different statements, as I compared them with my daughter's experience, I have gone back, I have tested the links in my chain of reasoning, they all appear sound, it does seem to be the case that according to the current teachings of the LDS Church, the sealing power does not have the ability to keep families together in the celestial kingdom, only to tear them apart. And having said that, there is really not much more to say. I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. If you like what you hear at Radio Free Mormon, please take the time to go to RadioFreeMormon.org and make a monthly donation. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.